Hey there, I'm Rachel Aaring, and you're listening to the Top Music Piano Podcast. Get inspired as we discuss creative resources, trends in piano pedagogy, ways to grow your income and streamline your studio, and new ways to engage your students each week. If you are a teacher who wants to go beyond the method books to create an innovative studio that fosters lifelong music makers, you've come to the right place. Hello, piano teachers. I'm so glad that you have chosen to be here to listen to this episode. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Elizabeth Davis Everhart, who is an expert in teaching students with neurodifferences. We decided today to talk about all of her favorite things for teaching her studio full of these amazing students. So we talk about physical products, but also about games, activities, and teaching techniques that you can quickly and easily implement into your studio. Dr. Elizabeth Davis Everhart is a piano pedagogue, music educator, writer, and church musician. She maintains a vibrant piano studio for students who are special learners, authors the creative piano pedagogy blog, teaches online courses in pedagogy, and is an active church musician and composer arranger. Elizabeth is an active adjudicator and presenter and is passionate about expanding adaptive pedagogy for special learners and creating practical resources for educators. Dr. Davis Everhart and her husband, James, reside in beautiful Savannah, Georgia. Here's my interview with Elizabeth. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. I am so glad to be talking with you again. Can you introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us a little bit about your teaching studio and your background? Sure. Well, thank you, Rachel, for having me. I loved our conversation last time, and it's just such a great privilege and opportunity to be able to talk to you again. So uh, I now live in Savannah, Georgia, and I have um, a very vibrant studio here. Uh, mostly in-person students right now. And in years past, it was more online teaching. But I kind of have a split studio now where it's in-person and online, mostly uh, one-to-one individual lessons. Uh, I am going to be restarting up some group classes in the next year or so that I used to offer pre-COVID until everything kind of shifted. But most of my students are autistic or have disabilities. Um, Some of the disabilities I have in my studio right now, um, I have one student with a tick disorder, Tourette's, um, lots of ADHD, OCD, oppositional defiant disorder. I have a couple who are showing signs of pathological demand avoidance with autism, which is really challenging. And um, just a whole mix of dyslexia and all kinds of fun things. So, Uh, I mainly teach students who are beginners or up to teenage years. I have taught um, college age at conservatories and youth conservatories and colleges in the past. But right now I concentrate on teaching younger students and do a lot of research about disabilities. So that's kind of my niche. (laughs) Right. And that's why I invited you on today to talk about all of those things. And you actually have a PhD in piano pedagogy, correct? Yes, I do. Excellent. So we, like you mentioned, we talked a few months ago, I guess it was, for my other podcast, um, Dynamic Piano Teaching. And I learned so much from you and your experience teaching students with neurodifferences. So today I wanted to take a little bit different angle. And we're going to talk about all of your favorite things for teaching these students. So it might be physical product, online product, your favorite ideas, all of these things we're going to cover. So why don't you start off by telling us your favorite thing to do early on in lessons when you've just met a student? Oh, that's my very favorite. I don't know what it is. It's kind of that new car smell for teachers. (laughs) Those first few lessons can be so magical and fun because both the teacher and the student are a bit nervous maybe about meeting each other. We don't know everything about each other yet. And it's just this wonderful opportunity to get to know each other. So some of my favorite things to do are um, to do improvisation activities, because it's a great way to get to know the student without putting them in the hot seat. Since a lot of students who come to my studio 
I know in advance that they have disabilities. The thing I'm not going to do is interview them their first lesson, right? Like interrogate them and ask them a bunch of questions, even though it may not come off as an interrogation. Like, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite animal? What's your favorite snack? Those kinds of things can be a little stressful for kids with disabilities. So instead of doing that, I'll shift to the piano and just keep everything about music and see what I can learn through the student then. So I love to do improvisation in the first lesson and just sit down and maybe get out some of my themed cards like rain or thunderstorm or animal sounds or um, cars and see what we can do to change the fast and the slow to see really what the student knows. Um, So I love doing things like that because kids can show you their personalities and it's so much fun. You can discover all kinds of things. So I love doing that in the first first few lessons. Um, and I really make make it very intentional to give opportunities for the student to show me what they know through asking them, um, can I, if I play this pattern, do you think you can play it back? Can we, can you copycat me? You know, just to give them opportunities to do that. Use some imaginative play at the instrument to kind of see what their capability is with showing their emotions. You know, what would this piece sound like if a hippo played it? What if we played it way down in the base of the piano? Can, can they imagine what a hippo would do? Because that's sometimes something that they can struggle with. So just doing silly things like that. And it's an intentional way of me assessing them, but also really intentionally wanting to get to know them. So I do really use improvisation a lot in those few lessons. I really like that idea. I'm curious if you have ever learned something surprising during those assessments? Oh, yes. (laughs) One of the most memorable is um, I was assessing and, you know, kind of going through this process. And I think it was either the second or third lesson with a student. And I know he'd had a little bit of prior music experience, but there weren't a lot of details on what that, you know, kind of looked like. um, If it was formal music lessons or piano or more group musical activities. So I gave him some opportunities to copycat and show me. And he started playing a Haydn sonata. (laughs) (laughs) And and here I was saying like, what would happen if a giraffe played this, you know? (laughs) And he's like, dun, 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 you know, and I'm like, oh my goodness. And so, um, you know, I I don't even remember what led to that, but I just kind of sat there with my mouth gaping open and my brain going, wow, this is why we do this. We have to give them opportunities to show us. Yeah. And, And I was kind of noticing like, wow, he may not know where middle C is. We might have some some things that are missing here, but no, he played this beautiful opening movement, and I was like, okay. <laughs> it was you had very to rewrite fun. that lesson plan right away, huh? Oh, it was in the best kind of way. We just jumped right in, and uh, it, it was a wonderful surprise. That is a good one. Do you have a favorite method book to use with your beginners who don't come in learning Haydn sonatas? <laughs> This is a great question, but I think it's also a hard one to answer. And um, hopefully my answer is not too frustrating, but honestly, it depends. I can tell you things I look for in method books for my beginners. I definitely want something that doesn't too heavily focus on finger numbers because numbers and music can be very, very confusing for students with disabilities. So we've, we've got so many different kinds of numbers that if I choose a method that really focuses on finger numbers for those beginning lessons, it can really be a roadblock for their learning. So I tend to err away from those. Uh, most often I use Tales of a Musical Journey by Irina Gorin. She's known for her really wonderful approach to pedagogy. But what I love about this method for beginners is it uses a very aural and rote way of teaching young children in a story. Um, I often leave out the story if I'm teaching a very literal child, like an autistic student. But I love the way it connects to children through animals, through uh, rote teaching and exploring the piano with just one finger at a time, adding one finger. And that kind of slow, methodical approach works beautifully 
and it just naturally transitions to reading on the staff. So I use that. And then of course I supplement like crazy. I use a lot of rope stuff from Piano Safari. I've even used a lot of my first piano adventure for some of those pieces. Um, so a combination of those with a lot of other supplemental things would probably be my answer. Yes, those are really, really good suggestions. So would you have the parent to buy maybe the Tales of a Musical Journey and then just supplement in the lessons with the other ones? That's a great question. Yes, I usually have them purchase Tales of a Musical Journey. And then the other things uh, I'll often do by rote or in the lesson with the student. And a lot of my students practicing takes place by um, listening or watching videos that I have made for them of these pieces um, because they have wonderful memories. But if I make a short little video using my over the piano camera, they can remember where their fingers go. So that's a lot of what we do. And the Tales of a Musical Journey is really cool because it has these orchestrated soundtracks that the kids can play with at home. So it's not like I'm there with them, but they have a beautifully steady beat. And I've heard some really wonderfully positive um, comments from parents that they love having those soundtracks to play with at home. So that kind of makes me happy. And I love that they enjoy practicing those at home. Yeah, that's so important, isn't it? <laughs> Can you share um, one of your favorite games that you like to play with your younger students? Yes, uh, I do a lot of ear training in my studio. We do intervals, we do directional reading, we do high and low, you know, all of those kinds of things. Uh, with my young beginner students, I love to use finger puppets that are animals. And I think I picked them up probably 10 years ago at Ikea, somewhere very random that you would not expect to get a bag of animal finger puppets, but they have um, a shark, a creepy looking bunny that looks a little odd that they always think is funny, a turtle, a frog. So I love to do ear training uh, to teach them the sounds of articulations and dynamics through those puppets. So we'll do lots of ear training and fun things with that. Uh, the all time favorite game in my studio is tic tac toe because I do it about probably 50 different ways. I have uh, determined different ways to use tic tac toe for ear training or notes. And so I have lots of fun little animals and erasers the kids will use. And hardly a week or a day goes by when a kid is not, oh, Dr. Elizabeth, can we please play tic tac toe? And it always surprises me, you know, as the kids get a little older, I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's time to phase out. But no, I had a 13 year old last week. You know, we haven't played tic-tac-toe yet this year. I was like, all right, another vote for tic-tac-toe. It's funny how we always think we have to reinvent the wheel, but really our students, they love repetition. They, I've no, noticed with my students, they love like the, you know, wrote songs that we did at the very beginning when I first introduced them, they're happy to redo things over and over, aren't they? Yes. And I think too, when I use a game like tic-tac-toe, it's so familiar. There is no learning curve required. So it's not like you have to explain, okay, first you spin the wheel and then you go, you know, it's not like this big board game. So they already know how to do it. And it's kind of like this exciting thing of, ooh, what will we do with it today? So I love that it taps into their desire to try something new with it while still having that sense of sameness. That's really fun. Can you give me just maybe one example of how you use tic-tac-toe in your studio? Yes. So one of the ways I do it is through intervals and in ear training. And I correlate them to movie themes most of the time. John Williams is very much loved in my studio. So for minor seconds that we kind of correlate that to Jaws. Um, and so I'll have a student pick two intervals, maybe a second and a fourth. And for that day, if I play um, a second and they guess a second, they get to move their piece. Um, or if I play a fourth, you know, and then what's great about this is we take turns. So then they have to play an interval for me, which gives them a chance to do the same thing in a different way. So they're showing me what they know not just by telling me, I think that's a fourth, but then they have to play it for me, which is great. That's really good. And then they get to be the teacher. Huh? Oh, and you know, when they do, they of course try to play it really low on the piano or really high. And they say, oh, it's going to be really hard. I hope you can get this. <laughs> and we just have so much fun. 
I love it. Is there a supplemental composer or series that you found really connects well with your students? That's a good question. One thing I always look for is music that has a very clean format. So not a lot of distractions, not a lot of crazy graphics or little teaching tips on the page. So I am drawn to composers like um, Paula Dreyer for her rote teaching, because I, obviously I can use that rote, but even for the reading, it's very clean. I use a lot of um, Chrissy Ricker, Dennis Alexander. One of my favorite series is the Contest Winners by Alfred Composers. They, I think there are three or four books and they just, it's a compilation of different Alfred Composers and the pages are super clean. I also look for kind of uh, larger font music so that it's not too compressed on the page. You have to be really careful in choosing music for kids with disabilities. So anything that the type setting does not look accurate or if there are rhythm inaccuracies. So I have to be super careful when choosing music, but I definitely look for ones that are are very clean and a little bit bigger font. That's really helpful. That's a good a good tip for teachers to be aware of. Do you have a favorite tool in your (laughs) uh, teaching studio? You know, when I was looking through this question, I was like, oh, I have so much weird stuff (laughs) Uh, in in a good way. But I think I already mentioned my finger puppets. I love those. And those are those are crazy cool. They're great for lots of things. One of my other favorite things are these plastic wiggly eyes that fit on your fingers. And I love using those for finger numbers. It's really great for teaching left and right as well, because you can put like a green one on the left finger and an orange on the right. I love doing that with little kids. And it's a really fun way to do finger numbers. Probably the most used thing in my studio is an erasable whiteboard. And I recently upgraded from like just a a whiteboard to one that has the music lines on it. And I can't remember, I got it from a shop on Etsy that was amazing. And it has little magnets that go on the staff and you can use it on the keyboard. But I use that whiteboard very often because it's such a great visual for kids. And then, of course, I couldn't live without my colored pencils. Um, it's a it's a tradition. Every lesson, a kid gets to come in and choose their colors for the day. So I have that little jar of colored pencils, and that is very well loved and very often sharpened. <laughs> yeah, that's the worst when your color pencils aren't sharp, isn't it? Oh, I had a, a kid really give me a hard time last week because the azure blue was dull. <laughs> was like, okay, I need to make sure on this specific day that blue is always sharpened. I want to talk just briefly about dyslexia. I feel like you mentioned it earlier that you have um, a student or students with dyslexia. And I feel like that's um, a topic that is, is kind of overlooked at times. And I'm wondering if you have any special tools or anything, any advice for teaching students with dyslexia. It is very much overlooked, but it's also really popular in ways that you wouldn't think it would be. So we often associate dyslexia with trouble reading, but dyslexia is a chaos in patterns. Um, This can make it difficult for students to see patterns. It can even affect their speaking and hearing, and it can also have musical implications. So there's types of dyslexia where students cannot hear musical patterns. It's crazy. It's a very complex disorder. So the main thing to remember is to use very clear language in talking about things that are opposite, like right, left, high, low, up, down. Things that are directional are often really hard. So if you're talking about going up the piano or going down the piano, my advice would be to choose one set of words to use for all of that. And what I use is higher and lower. And I use that for sound, like this sound is higher. I also use that for hands. This is your lower hand. It plays lower on the piano. And this is your higher hand. Of course, um, kids or even adult students may grow to feel comfortable using left and right. But if you just choose one set of words like high or low, up or down, this is your down hand. This is your up hand. That can really simplify the learning because everything they associate with higher will become right higher sounds, higher up the staff, that's higher up the piano, 
lower down the staff is lower down the piano. So that's the one thing is just to keep that very clear. And then of course, use colors. Colors are really proven to help differentiate differences for people with dyslexia. I have different colored fly swats that are, uh, are kind of like bedazzled fly swats I use for little kids. There's one red and one blue. And that's really helpful for just going back and forth because again, feeling that pattern and feeling the differences. Um, one tool I have that is really not a common one for music teachers are these transparent, colorful overlays. And you can get them on Amazon, but they simply go over top of the music on the piano. They're heavily used in special education in school because it helps to relieve the stress from your eyes of focusing on a pattern. So my students prefer like orange or yellow, something that they can still see the music clearly. But um, those work very well. And I also use them with students who have autism or ADHD, and they just think it's fun. Like, ooh, I think I want to use blue on my music today. But I do use them a lot with my dyslexic students, and they can be very helpful. That's a really helpful tip for us. Um, I want to go back to the color thing. You were talking about like the fly swatters and putting something on the fingers. Do you stay consistent with the colors? Like the high is always a certain color and the low is always a certain color or can, does that help or does it matter? That's a really good question. You will find some teachers who are, are very married to the fact that yes, right needs to be red, left is blue, or they'll have set colors for that. I do not do that as much. I actually let the students choose which color they would like for each hand to be. The reason I do that is because I want the students to feel comfortable with associating left and right with different things than a set of colors. Uh, I do have some kids who are pretty rigid and they need to use the same colors all the time. But 99% of the time, my students will switch up those colors every week. And especially as they get older, they might just color the one hand that they have trouble with. But I, I use those colors interchangeably so that they do not strictly rely on those in case for some reason we don't have those colors. They're okay with switching back and forth. It's more of choosing two very different looking colors. I'm curious if there's anything that teachers should avoid when working with these students, maybe something that's really popular teaching neurotypical students or that works well with neurotypical students that you find doesn't work so well with these students. I think one of the main things is well, several of the main things to avoid are all tied into this aspect of communication. Um, for our neurodivergent students, we really want to avoid extremes. So that would be in our levels of talking. Uh, you'll see a lot of elementary teachers in neurotypical classrooms use a lot of extremes in their gestures and voices because it's proven to get kids' attention very well. But for kids with disabilities, this can also cause them a lot of stress because they do not have the filters to think through all of those emotions that we're expressing. So it actually puts them through kind of a stressful turn of thoughts like, why, why are they jumping up and down? Why are their eyebrows raised? Why is their voice so loud? What's going on? When we really just want them to focus on what we're saying, that's what we want. So avoiding levels of extreme in our gestures, um, avoiding levels of extreme in our attitudes, our moods, keeping a sense of calm and sameness. I also really try to avoid responding to a child in a way that they've spoken to me if they're having a behavior issue. So if a child is having a, a bad day uh, where they're having a behavior or showing a behavior that is not typical, you do not want to respond in that same way. You want to respond in a sense of calmness to build trust so that child knows, even if they're having a bad day, I know Dr. Elizabeth is going to respond X, Y, Z. So just really avoiding extremes in yourself, in your studio, avoid lots of change, changes um, and keep yourself very centered because that is what the student needs. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about different disabilities like ADHD is one where we kind of think everything needs to be very fast paced and exciting. But really, kids with ADHD thrive in structured environments. 
So keeping a calm sense of sameness really helps them to become focused and to be able to process their emotions as they're learning. Uh, One of the other big things is to avoid assumptions. And this is a big one because you'll, you'll meet both groups of people. You'll meet people who assume that children with ADHD or autism or dyslexia cannot do. And they'll name a whole bunch of things like recitals or play classical music or play standard notation or play with both hands. There's a whole bunch of things. But you'll also meet a lot of people who say the opposite. Kids with disabilities cannot do, you know, or never can. Just never assume. Just like I shared with the student I learned through improvisation could play a Haydn sonata. You never know. Kids are constantly absorbing. They're like little sponges and they're so highly intelligent. So never assume, always give them an opportunity to show you what they know and learn from them. There is so much great advice in that answer. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I think what you're saying about staying calm and keeping things the same, it can be a little counterintuitive. I think especially if the kid is, you know, a little unfocused and kind of all over the place, we think we need to have more extremes and more change and more excitement. But it sounds like that's not necessarily the case. Well, and it's not that you can't have fun with the student. And if they're laughing, it's not that you should never laugh or get silly with them. But it's it's this idea of kind of keeping yourself centered. So that way, if the child is having an extreme, you are still centered. If the child is having an extreme the other way, you're still centered. Because you always want to draw it back to music. And there's a really wonderful quote that says... Um, An escalated adult cannot de-escalate an escalated child. That's very good. Say that one more time. An escalated adult cannot de-escalate an escalated child. So if we are like up here, we cannot bring a child down to a sense of calm. Yes, that's that's so true. And it's not about, you know, you can't react with your student when they giggle or when they make a silly mistake or if they laugh, but it's just about maintaining that sense of calm because their moods can change very quickly and they need consistency that helps to build trust. And that goes a really long way. Since we're on this topic, let's talk about your favorite way to refocus a student who maybe has gone a little off the rails, gotten a little (laughs) distracted. How do we bring it back to the music? Oh, I'm sure so many teachers have students like this. I I get Facebook and Instagram messages about this a lot. <laughs> what do I do? My students always going off on a tangent about trains. My top suggestion is to simply start doing the activity that you want the student to do. So if I'm trying to lead my student into an improvisation and they go off the rails talking about Beethoven. I have a student right now who does this and incessantly talks about Mozart or starts like playing the piano, like not in a controlled way. I will just softly start playing the piano and say, hey, can you join in and play Black Keys? This is going to be really beautiful. And I'll just start playing. So just start the activity you want the student to join you on. If that's learning a new piece, just start playing it for them and say, oh, can you hear the jumping staccatos? Or sometimes it's, it's time to say, all right, it's going to, it's time to play our new song. Let me show you where your right hand is. Here we go. <laughs> and you just kind of lead them. It's all about redirection. And that's a, that's a popular term in child development right now, redirection. And it's this idea of instead of reflecting on the fact that we're off the rails with the child and saying, okay, we're really off track. This is not what we should be talking about. Just go ahead to the next activity because the child already knows that they're off track. So we don't need to spend time telling them that we're off track. So just go ahead and redirect, go to the next thing. It's very highly effective. It's calming and it's a great way to get them to move on without making them feel badly that they have kind of derailed. Um, If that doesn't work, then I just choose something completely different. Like I'll start playing a rope piece and say, oh, can you copy me? Um, I'll start doing an improv with little prompt cards or say, um, I'll play a third and say, oh, this is a third. Can you find one? And I'll just instantly start doing an activity and just kind of create an environment where they're invited to join along. 
I think this is good parenting advice too. I'm going to try <laughs> this out with my son. <laughs> it really does work. And it's, uh, I actually follow a couple of Instagram pages that have a lot of parenting advice because there's so much overlap in the child development aspect and child psychology to teaching that we can learn from. And redirection is a very popular thing because it's so easy to do. It's a bit hard for adults because we kind of want to sit in this place of this is not what we're supposed to be doing right now, rather than to just go ahead and skip over that little ditch and go to this is our next thing. Do you have some advice for a teacher who is maybe teaching a neurodiverse student for the very first time? Oh, that's an exciting and kind of scary place to be. If you, this is your first time ever teaching a neurodivergent student, or maybe the first time you've realized the student has a learning difference, listen more than you talk. Become very highly observant of your student. Your job is now to learn that student and become an expert in them. Learn what works for them, what makes them feel frustrated. Uh, learn how they learn. How do they think? How do they react when you bring up something new? What is their response and their body language? Take note of everything and how they respond to your questions. And the reason this is so important is because a huge part of teaching kids with disabilities is learning what makes them tick. Finding the end. That's what Dr. Scott Price used to say when I was uh, working with him. He was my mentor. Find the end. Find what means something to your student. You cannot do that unless you know them and you will not be effective working with them unless they let you in. So you have to learn them and you have to be devoted to observing them and observing yourself. Uh, you may discover things about yourself that are a bit frustrating, like the student is not responding well to my instruction. I have never had this happen before when I've taught quarter notes. What's going on? So you may learn that the things that you're accustomed to doing are not going to work. And that does not mean you're doing it incorrectly. It just means that you and the student are not on the same wavelength. So you have to be willing to observe and kind of get a little reflective with yourself and think, hmm, this may be a simple solution, but I'm going to try it and see if it works this time. So a lot of listening, uh, giving them opportunities to show you what they know. That's one of my big things um, I teach in my course and give students opportunities to show you what they know. Really, really good advice, Elizabeth. Can you talk a little bit about the course that you offer? Sure. It's Adaptive Piano Pedagogy 101, and it's a very unique class. I designed this to be not only a, a way to help teachers know the best methods for teaching kids with disabilities, but one of the most important aspects of that, like we just talked about, is getting to know the student. And you can't do that unless you have a bit of background on those disabilities. Our information on disabilities doesn't come from the piano world. It comes from research, from scientists, from child development experts. So this course, the first couple of weeks, focuses on disabilities, learning what they are, how kids get diagnosed, and kind of digs into that. So then you have a better picture of the student sitting in front of you. And then we go through all the ways to teach them how to communicate, how to choose music, how to adapt methods, how to work with parents, how to teach improvisation, how to teach games, all this fun stuff that hopefully allows the teachers to be empowered with the tools they need to teach the student in front of them. That sounds really exciting and like so much great information. Uh, you were mentioning before we started recording that you have a couple other things in the works. Would you like to share about I those? I do. I would love to. So I have a few things I've been working on a little by little. Um, hopefully this fall, a few months away, I'll have um, a new podcast devoted to adaptive piano teaching, which is very exciting. Hopefully a great way to answer lots of questions and kind of dig into this topic in a consistent way. So the teachers will have that resource. I'm also working on two courses about improvisation. One is practical improvisation for teachers. Um, improvisation is a huge tool we can use to get to know our students and teach them a lot, teach our students lots of musical things. So a little course on just basics of improv for teachers. And then 
a little bit of a bigger course is intentional improvisation. So this is how we teach these cool things and lessons to kids, how we get to know them, how to teach um, keyboard geography, how to teach rhythm, how to teach coordination and technique and pedaling and dynamics all through improvisation. So it will guide teachers through the process of how to use improvisation intentionally in their studios and with their students. Those sound like really great resources. I'm going to keep following you because those sound like all things that I need to learn. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. Those. Yes, of course. <laughs> if uh, teachers want to stay in contact with you and follow along with what you're doing, where's the best place to find you? I am at Instagram, um, Creative Piano Pedagogy. That's where I post videos and links to my blog posts. You can also check out my website, which has my blog and soon to be store where I'll have lots of free um, resources. And you can check out my courses, elizabethdavispiano.com. So those are the two places and on Facebook at Creative Piano Pedagogy as well. Great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. This has been so enlightening and I love all of your favorite things that you shared with us and all the advice you gave. So I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Elizabeth. I always love talking with Elizabeth. You can sense her love for her students and her excitement for what she does from the minute you meet her. If this episode inspired you and you want to continue learning about teaching students with neurodifferences, Top Music has some great new resources for you. Be sure to check out the free Top Music magazine in the show notes and then head over to the Top Music Pro membership site. If you aren't a member yet, this would be a great time to join. We've just released a brand new course titled Unfazed, Teaching Neurodivergent Students. Unfazed is an online course designed to help you supercharge your teaching so you can feel confident taking on any student with special needs and open the door to hundreds of prospective students. If you would like to recognize a student's learning needs upon meeting them for the first time, have an exact roadmap for effectively teaching any student to read notes, and have a wealth of pre-planned activities for every aspect of piano lessons, then this course is for you. To get access to this incredible course, go to Top Music Co to join the Top Music membership today. I'm Rachel Aaring, and you've been listening to the Top Music Piano Podcast. I'll see you back here next week. How do you keep up to date with all the latest trends and research into music education? How do you connect with other teachers around the world and make sure your teaching stays fresh and relevant for students of all ages and stages both now and into the future? I created our Top Music Pro membership to be the one-stop shop for music teaching resources, training, support and community and I'd love for you to come and join us inside. With over 40 comprehensive training courses, hundreds of teaching demonstrations and lesson plans, free monthly sheet music, discounts, and all the business and pedagogy support you could ever need, Top Music Pro is the community you've been looking for. If you're ready to level up your learning from the podcast and join thousands of other teachers in our global network, head over to topmusicpro.com today.